Just a small click. What could be more harmless? Simple child's play. That mere click opens up a world of content. An infinite amount of music, series, films. What could be more harmless? One click sets streaming loose, bringing this infinite yet devastating creation to life. Streaming, a slow death happening under our very eyes that we can't see. It spews a hundred million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, gobbles up tons of raw materials, generates mountains of waste. Because of streaming, digital technology will soon make up 6% of greenhouse gas emissions, equaling aviation. It will soon be even more polluting than cars. Streaming has invaded our lives, enmeshing into our private lives, our families, our work. The monster has colonized our day to day. It should be at our service, but we're at its mercy. We're imprisoned and suffocated by this monster we ourselves created. The beast has got away from us, only to turn on us instead. It's up to us to take back control from streaming before it swallows us whole. In 2025, 181 zettabytes of data will have been exchanged on the internet. That's 181,000 billion bytes. Is that meaningless to you? That's only natural. Such a level of traffic exceeds comprehension. And to think back when it all began, every byte mattered. Streaming was a rare and reasonable thing. The history of streaming is a success story cast in the American mold. From its inception, tiny streaming had to fight to make a place for itself because the internet was not made with it in mind. The web at the beginning of the 90s was a lab, a wild west of the future, one filled with colourful characters. That internet was rudimentary and not all that fun. It was not very multimedia. It was, well, an ordinator, which was more austere. No sound, no image, no text. All that would change thanks to one man, Rob Glazer. Without him, there'd be no Netflix, no Zoom, no YouTube, no Spotify. Lockdowns would have felt a whole lot longer without this man. I am the father of four children, so uh, that I'm sure of. Uh, but yes, I was very involved in the creation of the, of the commercial internet streaming industry and very proud of that. Rob is a Microsoft engineer. In the spring of 1993, he attended a conference organized by Mitch Kaper, one of the pioneers of the internet. So I'm at this meeting, and one of Mitch's colleagues, a guy named Dave Farber, who is really one of the fathers of the internet for real, he's one of the originators of the technology that led to the internet, he says, hey, everybody, you want to see this mosaic thing? So I saw this browser uh, that would allow you to see websites on the internet. One of the in innovations that they had created was they had the ability to have still pictures in the browser pages, so it would be text, and still pictures. And my immediate reaction was, this is the future. And so I immediately had the thought, what if we can add audio and video to that experience as well? So that was where I got the inspiration to create what became the streaming industry. At the same time as the internet, another network came into existence. Its name was IPCC, and it published its first report in 1990, putting forth a hypothesis. What if human activity was causing the planet to warm up? Et le réchauffement de la Terre, même si certains n'osent pas s'en plaindre, risque d'avoir des conséquences dramatiques d'ici la fin du siècle. Rob and his geek friends don't care. Who could predict that their creature would make up 82% of online traffic 30 years on, making it the main source of digital pollution? At that time, streaming was nothing but a business opportunity that needed to be brought to life. And this was in 1995, is that the internet was still, uh, in many cases, being experienced over very narrow pipes, typically oftentimes when people would dial up uh, over the regular phone network. The internet wasn't a pollutant yet. The web had been grafted onto the extant telephone network, the good old-fashioned copper that was already in place. No need to run cables or install new relays, no pollution. Everything was already in place. It was, however, slow, very slow. 1,000 times slower than fiber optics. Little data, few files. The web was plain, reasonable, curbed by the narrow scope of the telecommunications networks. The slow connection speed of the time allowed for reading text, which needs little data, 
But when it came to transmitting audio or video, which are hundreds of times more cumbersome, things stalled. In order to bring streaming to life, compression was the answer. D'abord, il fallait numériser les contenus, donc prendre les, les contenus tels qu'ils existaient, les rendre numériques. Et euh, une fois qu'on les avait numérisés, la taille qu'ils occupaient euh, pour les faire passer dans les tuyaux de l'époque, ce n'était pas, euh, pas euh, possible. Ou ça limitait beaucoup euh, notre capacité de transmission. Alors l'astuce, le, le, ça consistait à prendre la résolution existante, le nombre de pixels qu'on avait dans une image, les descendre. Donc on avait tendance à descendre la résolution des, des images, ce qui voulait dire perte de détails. Et... Compression lightened the data load, making it simple, eco-friendly, as we'd call it today. This slim down was vital to streaming in order to get it through still narrow cables. It was first used on sound files thanks to a German engineer. Ich habe eigentlich mein ganzes Berufsleben lang immer an Audiotechnologien gearbeitet. Zunächst an der Frage, wie man Töne, Musik möglichst datensparend übertragen kann, also Carl Heinz headed a gang of computer engineers at the Fraunhofer Institute of Psychoacoustic Research. Their mission was to lighten the load of a sound file so as to only keep the information our brains would find most necessary and pleasing. It was a very important mission for this great music lover. I have eigentlich einen ziemlich breiten Musikgeschmack, also bei klassischer Musik über alle Zeiten und bei Pop und Rockmusik. Aber kein Hard Rock. In order to carry out his research, he picked out a song from his catalogue, Suzanne Vega's Tom's Diner. Ich habe gelesen in einer Hi-Fi-Fachzeitschrift, dass dieses A Cappella-Stück von äh, Susan Vega, Tom's Diner, zum Testen von Lautsprechern verwendet wurde. Und dann habe ich gedacht, ja, schauen wir mal, wie das klingt äh, über dieses Vorgängerverfahren zu MP3. Und es klang schauderhaft. Tom Steiner von Susan Vega war bloß zu einem bestimmten Zeitpunkt das mit Abstand schwier am schwierigsten zu kodierende. Das hat uns am meisten Kopfschmerzen bereitet. The song became the yardstick he'd used to refine his algorithm and so he listened to it. Then listened to it some more for nearly 10 years until that voice sounded as clear as crystal once more. The MP3 was born. Despite the assault on his eardrums from 10,000 nightmarish plays, Carl is still friends with Suzanne. <laughs> Thanks to MP3s, a format friendly to the ears and light on data, compression became the next engineering pet project. Scaling everything down would create the biggest selling point of streaming. Its speed. Die Standard-Internetleitung hätte für eine normale CD wirklich sechs Stunden oder länger gebraucht zum Hochladen oder auch zum Herunterladen. Und mit unserer Technik war das eben dann ein Faktor 10, was immer noch lang war, aber doch viel schneller als vorher möglich. The race for speed was on. The Internet was going turbo. And that was just the beginning. Audio had paved the way. Its official birthday was Tuesday, September the 5th, 1995. Streaming took its first steps as the commentary to a baseball match played by Rob's home team, the Seattle Mariners. So I contacted my friends at the Mariners and I said, is it okay if we broadcast one of these live streams? And uh, one of these streams over the internet. And I got two responses, which was, what is that? And then when I explained it, it was like, okay, that's cool. Uh, so uh, we took a game that happened to be a game between the Seattle Mariners and the New York Yankees. Let us know if you enjoyed this uh, first broadcast on the internet, listening on the worldwide web in Australia. We broadcast this stream live, uh, and it was the first uh, live uh, live stream that we did. I think the first live stream of any kind, and uh, it was uh, it kind of became a historical moment for the internet. <laughs> We had tested it and we were pretty sure it worked, but baseball games are long. They run about three hours. And it turned out we had a bug in our software that after two and a half hours, uh, we had a buffer overflow. Streaming will course correct and even better, make itself indispensable. How? 
thanks to Rob Glazer, he would inject a virus that would infect the internet, hypnotise users, cause a data avalanche, and 25 years later, give off 100 million tonnes of CO2 a year. And that virus was video. In 1997, RealPlayer uploaded its first streaming video, a short film directed by a renowned indie director. So we went to the film director, Spike Lee, and made an arrangement with him when we were going to launch Real Video, which was in February of 1997. So I met with Spike, um, who was a very uh, brilliant but also independent-minded person, and asked him, you know, would he consider making these short videos? And he said yes, and we said, you, you shoot whatever you want. The third film, you meet a young genius, Fabian Glover, star and choreographer of Bring the Funk, Bring the Noise. When he said he wanted to interview Savian Glover, I thought, oh, okay, uh, that would be interesting. I'm sure he's a very smart, creative guy. But what he does is tap dancing. I hear a tune in my head. I said, I try to produce it through my feet. You know, like, um, So uh, our technical team almost had a kind of a heart attack when I said to them, well, it's a video of a man tap dancing. How good a job can we do of showing his feet moving around? A video needs details to flow. Compression specifically removes those data-drenched details. As such, the ultra-compression necessary for streaming causes a pixel mess. But the real player guys were fearless. So we were able to hand tune the video so that the tap dancing would actually look like tap dancing and not just a blur. It was October 1997, and streaming had taken its first tentative steps. So we're pulling down this clip, and this is really more streaming. We're watching it as it's coming down. Right. And it's sacrificing audio and image quality. And we can see it's a little delivery. jumpy. It's a lot jumpy. Yeah. Uh, but that's the price you pay for seeing it in real time. Exactly. All right, now, w what's the application here? I mean, is this for hobbyists? I mean, I'm not really going to sit around here for a half hour or watch some jumpy little clip in a posted stamp size window, am I? The Kyoto Protocol was ratified that same year. For the first time, the ratifying countries would commit to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. The web, for its part, didn't commit to anything, and never would. At the end of the 90s, it was still clean. Compression yielded eyesores, but it acted as a safeguard. It squeezed the stream down enough to make it fit through the cables. The infrastructure set the rules. It was up to content to adapt and give way. The same went for quality. But as the web grew, compression would become unnecessary and be cast off. No more moderation. The beast would be unleashed. In the early 2000s, a new connection mode appeared, which enabled streaming to take over the internet. Its name? Broadband. Four letters, ADSL. A bandwidth increase reaching speeds between 20 and 50 times that of classic networks. Ce que ça implique, c'est que euh, on va pouvoir accéder à des contenus auxquels on ne pouvait pas accéder. Donc le premier saut euh, important, la première rupture, c'est la connexion au débit dans tous les foyers en France au travers de la généralisation de la DSL. Personal computers have become part of life at home. The number of internet users in France and Germany grew from 2.5 million in 1995 to over 41 million in 2001. Month after month, website after website, internet started to bloom. The web became sexy. Society as a whole leapt onto this new bandwagon headfirst with its eyes closed, scarcely able to keep pace with its rapid changes. Broadband was the, the magic thing that took streaming from a, you know, audio and short videos and small videos to something that could be broadcast quality and even high definition quality. And so the, the rise of broadband, which was kind of a step-by-step -step process. It wasn't like one year all of a sudden there was broadband. Rolling out broadband required the creation of a new infrastructure. Plastic and copper flooded the world. The floodgates opened without limits, just like during the peak of the post-war boom. Thanks to a new network that was up to scratch at last and freed from the shackles of compression, streaming made its appearance. In order to conquer the internet and flood us with content, it first had to follow the lead of its big brother, downloading. This was the technology that would lay the groundwork.
de la fin des années 90 jusqu'au milieu des années 2000, en gros, voire même à la fin des années 2000, hein, pour le grand public, c'est le téléchargement qui est le roi. Parce que ça marche bien, euh, technologiquement c'est pertinent avec la bande passante du moment, et tout le monde comprend comment ça fonctionne. Streaming requires data to be read in real time, so an uninterrupted connection is imperative. The issue was that whilst ADSL was initially fast and furious, it was unstable. Playback was sometimes choppy, which spoiled the mood. Downloading a film or song means seeing it transported peer-to-peer -peer in its entirety from one computer to another. It may take a long time, but the file will certainly get there. Once the file has been downloaded, it can be accessed with a simple click. On vivait dans l'ère de la rareté dans le, dans le, dans le 20e siècle, c'est-à-dire que euh, si je cherchais un disque, si je n'avais pas accès physiquement, bah, je ne pouvais pas l'écouter tout simplement. Il fallait que j'aie un CD, qu'on me prête une cassette, ou que j'entende ce morceau à la radio, ou que j'aille voir un concert en gros. À partir du duo MP3 euh, Pierre to Pierre sur Internet, euh, si j'ai envie d'écouter un, un morceau, je le cherche sur Internet et puis je peux le trouver. Et donc ça, c'est une révolution complètement dingue. Downloading set a new standard for the Internet. Unlimited choice. Millions of songs got shared as MP3s. Do you remember? We're off for Germany and Karls Heinz Brandenburg's headphones. His discoveries made music immaterial, impalpable. It was a breakthrough in art history. Now a stream, music began to flow continuously. Once open, the tap would never close. Le MP3 a préparé la, j'allais dire la philosophie, le, le, les internautes en fait devaient passer presque par le MP3, par le téléchargement, par l'idée de manipuler des fichiers pour comprendre intellectuellement euh, l'idée du streaming qui est de lire de la musique sur internet. Si on était passé directement du CD au streaming, probablement que ça aurait peut-être pas marché tout de suite euh, en termes intellectuels parce que euh, ça aurait été une rupture trop forte probablement et que le glissement par le téléchargement a permis d'avoir une sorte de, de sas technologique euh, nécessaire euh, également intellectuellement. Most importantly, downloads are free. They introduced an environmentally devastating concept that data exchanged on the internet has no value. Imagine a world with free petrol, where it costs no money to fill up the tank at the beginning of the century. That was how the web worked. A completely free cultural shopping center that was open 24 hours a day. Coupled with cheap, unlimited broadband, why even bother turning off any computers or routers? Computers became overflowing with files, electrical consumption soared, servers began to overheat. Worried environmentalists were not the first to bay for downloads blood. The first parties to speak out and make their voices heard were copyright protectors. Le vol dans un pays démocratique comme la France, il doit être sanctionné. Studios and record labels would put an end to downloading and turn streaming into their life preserver by adopting a paid legal offering. With downloading, files land on a user's computer, which is their physical property. The record label loses complete control over its songs. The user can keep sharing the file forever. A song that's streamed only passes through the user's computer, as though it were let. It's not owned. As soon as it's been consumed, it disappears. Inside the still warm dead body of the download model, record labels implanted a new brain. Streaming made itself more attractive by costing less than the price of a CD a month and being completely legal. It would offer extensive platforms with unlimited catalogues, a benefit of downloading that users would take for granted. Clean cut and well packaged, it would now be able to make a mint for its rights holders and for the platforms. Launched in 2008, Spotify now boasts 406 million users and 82 million songs, with 60,000 new ones added each day. In 2020, Spotify generated 169,000 tons of CO2, which is more than the American music industry did in 2000, when plastic gobbling CDs were at their peak. The intangible pollutes more than the tangible. Digital is dirtier than physical. Streaming showed its true face. Things are even more dire where YouTube is concerned. 
At a minimum, the platform generates 11 billion tonnes of CO2 a year, the same as a city like Frankfurt or Glasgow. And to think it all started in front of friendly elephants. All right, so here we are in front of the uh, elephants. Um, cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts, and that's that's cool. And that's pretty much all there is to say. This was the first video posted on the site on April the 24th, 2005. It was filmed at San Diego Zoo, like an ode to the biodiversity YouTube would help cause to disappear. The young man on screen is Jawad Karim. Behind the camera is Chad Hurley, with assistance from Steve Chan. The three young geeks founded the website, which they launched from a garage. They perfected real-time video reading technology, destined for wider audiences. Their discovery attracted Silicon Valley investors. YouTube did a great job of making uploading easy. But the problem with making uploading easy is, therefore, a lot of people are going to upload stuff they don't have the right to upload. Users got something free and easy that worked, a popularity built on the same scaffolding as downloading. YouTube, c'est fondamentalement une plateforme de streaming. Et c'est fondamentalement une plateforme de streaming pirate. C'est ça qui est... En fait, on l'oublie et on ne le rappelle pas. YouTube est une plateforme pirate, c'est-à-dire que... Personne n'a le droit de diffuser de la musique à tout le monde sur YouTube comme personne n'avait le droit de le faire sur Napster, sur La Moyeur, sur Emule. In the case of YouTube, it was uh, it was uh, uploaded illegally, but then it was streaming, so you had the real-time benefit. But a lot of the content that was on YouTube was not licensed, but the rights holders, uh, you know, it were were uh, trying to figure out how to deal with it, and YouTube found like a, almost like a hole in the um, in the in the in, in the uh, universe to escape through. YouTube brought streaming into the mainstream, pirated but tolerated content living next to lucrative legal videos. Streaming was a two-pronged attack, a double offering that swept everything from its path. YouTube est devenu le la porte d'entrée du quotidien. C'est là où on va regarder le, les, les extraits des matchs de foot avec les buts, c'est là qu'on va regarder euh, la vidéo qui a été envoyée euh, par la petite sœur, euh, etc. En fait, c'est là qu'on regarde le monde se faire. Streaming became enmeshed in our lives, turning into a monster. Nearly 6 billion videos are watched every day, 4 million a minute. Streaming is a deluge, a sweeping tide pulling us into its abyss. We binge on data and waste about as much. Removing the video whilst listening to a song could reduce CO2 emissions by 500,000 tons. Only YouTube makes turning off the video impossible. YouTube is after an ever-increasing audience and views. Where do we find the time to watch so many videos? The blame lies with this man and his little gadget that's seen two billion sales. He incited one of the most significant raw materials depletions in the modern age. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. And we are calling it iPhone. Its strength lay in how addictive its attractiveness and ease of use made it. It captured users' imaginations with its vision of a glossier future. That same year the iPhone was launched, the IPCC shared its fourth report, just like Steve Jobs, the climate scientist, talked that about a revolution. One of a world in which climate change is indisputable and temperatures are set to rise between 2 and 4.5 degrees before 2100. It's not enough to stop Rob, Steve, and all of Silicon Valley, whose verve towards the creature was undimmed. Uh, and when you combine with the fact that the mobile networks were starting to go to 3G and then to 4G and now beyond, that, uh, that you could get good quality audio and then good quality video on your phone uh, without being uh, connected to, to broadband. So that, that, that revolution obviously took the internet uh, from everyone's PC to everyone's pocket. So it made it so much bigger in so many ways, including streaming. Smartphones had released the monster from its cave. Streaming has colonized the smallest aspects of our existence. 
Et en fait, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que les courbes d'utilisation du streaming suivent exactement les courbes de déploiement de la 3G et des abonnements 3G et les courbes de pénétration aussi des smartphones. En fait, les trois courbes sont super similaires euh, parce que les trois technologies vont vraiment de pair. Et il faut attendre 2015-2018. C'est pas pour rien que, que c'est pendant ces années-là que le streaming devient, euh, devient grand public. C'est juste que la technologie est mûre, tout le monde a un smartphone dans la poche et il n'y a plus qu'un. À la fin des années 2020, le streaming a atteint son dream, devenant la technologie technology. The adoption of fiber optic broadband solidified its triumph, heralding a new service, Video On Demand, through platforms like Netflix or Amazon Prime. Streaming has replaced movie theaters and televisions. It's invaded our living rooms and become a new family member. It's taken over culture. This sharp technological turn was made possible by the benefits of streaming. Connected super fast and unlimited, it's the triumphant symbol of our times. But the cost of its success is striking. It seized 80% of all bandwidth and spews 100 million tons of CO2 a year, as much as the Czech Republic. And it's gaining momentum. The amount of pornography streamed in 2022 is set to release 80 million tons of CO2, an output equal to Belgium's. In 2025, digital will contribute to 6% of all emissions nearly as much as cars. Unlike all other forms of pollution, this one can't be seen. Alors quand on fait du streaming, en fait, qu'est-ce qui se passe On récupère des données en temps réel ou quasi réel qui viennent d'un endroit distant. Ces données, euh, elles circulent pas dans l'air en fait. Elles ont besoin d'un support physique pour circuler. On a un peu euh, euh, une espèce de pensée magique autour du fait que euh, le numérique, euh, c'est virtuel. D'ailleurs, il y, y a tout un tas de mots, il hein, y a tout un vocabulaire qui est associé à ça, euh, qui, qui nous laisse dans cette pensée. Il ben, y a le mot virtuel, il y a le mot cloud, par exemple, hein, qui, qui nous donne l'image du nuage euh, euh, tout blanc, tout pur. This cloud isn't made up of small water particles. It's made up of millions of kilometers of cables, relays, computers, and each of them stuffed full of metals and plastic. Le cloud, c'est une technologie qui s'est développée à partir des années, on va dire, 2010, et qui permet de virtualiser l'informatique. C'est-à-dire que pour une entreprise qui avant avait ses propres serveurs euh, et stocké ses données chez elle, ça lui permet, en fait, via l'accès à Internet, d'avoir ses données hébergées ailleurs, chez un prestataire, mais également son système informatique. All those files would get transferred to data centers. Marketing magicians would cover up the phenomenon, distorting it by calling it dematerialization. On appelle ça un nuage. Un nuage, c'est voluptueux, c'est léger, c'est naturel, c'est essentiel. Ah, on a tout gagné. Donc c'est la plus belle invention marketing, je pense, du monde moderne. En, de, de manière générale, c'est la dématérialisation, c'est fabuleux. Parce que finalement, le cerveau humain n'est pas câblé pour ressentir des dangers que les sens ne peuvent pas percevoir. Data centers are the essential cogs of the streaming machine, its reactor core. Its cold bunkers and odorless pollution alone account for 25% of all digital related greenhouse gas emissions. Quand on va lancer une vidéo en streaming, les toutes premières secondes de votre vidéo vont être euh, euh, enfin chargées sur un data center qui est très près de chez vous. Le temps que euh, ces données arrivent, un autre data center, un peu plus gros, un peu plus loin, va charger le reste. Et euh, pendant ce temps-là, un troisième, encore plus loin, va télécharger, enfin va charger en fait tout le reste de votre film ou de votre vidéo. In order to accommodate all internet users, there are data centers all over the world. On average, a data packet travels 15,000 kilometers. And just like cars, the further it goes, the more energy it'll use. Chaque fois qu'on qu transporte de la donnée d'un point à un autre sur Terre, en fait, on, on va traverser tout un tas d'équipements euh, qui sont des équipements réseau et qui sont des équipements qui sont branchés électriquement 
Et donc, si on a une longue distance, euh, en général, en moyenne, on va avoir plus d'équipement et donc ça va coûter plus cher en, en énergie. Ça coûte plus cher en énergie et donc ça génère plus de gaz à effet de serre. For our comfort and to eliminate each possible millisecond of waiting time before a video plays, these servers run 24-7, a level of usage requiring very power-hungry air conditioners to cool down the machines. It's all beginning to strain our electrical grids. Aujourd'hui, euh, bon, par exemple, en France, le numérique, c'est 8, 8 à 10 de la consommation électrique totale, donc c'est quand même déjà beaucoup. That's a bigger share than the city of Lyon. But things are more a matter of quality than quantity. There's cleaner and dirtier electricity, and the energy mix can swing between both extremes. On sait que euh, en Chine, le charbon est extrêmement utilisé pour euh, les industries numériques. On sait aussi que euh, sur la côte est des États-Unis, hein, euh, dans les secteurs euh, de Virginie, euh, vers, vers les Appalaches, etc., l'énergie charbon elle est aussi extrêmement utilisée encore. Donc on a euh, effectivement du data center le plus dirty jusqu'à celui euh, qui est le plus euh, propre. The latest generation data centers are vast. They're called hyperscale. By pooling devices together, they consume less and drastically reduce their emissions. Good on them. Just one problem though. Their location. Le premier critère pour les data centers, c'est de se situer près d'une source d'électricité puissante. C'est-à-dire d'être sûr d'avoir beaucoup de puissance pour longtemps, pour pouvoir grandir et pour pouvoir accueillir de plus en plus de clients. Ça peut poser problème pour d'autres entreprises ou d'autres industries ou d'autres activités qui auraient besoin d'une puissance électrique et qui, du coup, n'en auraient plus euh, la possibilité. Ireland is proof positive. The Republic provided tax breaks to Microsoft, Google and Amazon. So the American giant set up there en masse. By 2030, it may house hundreds of data centers which could use up 70% of Ireland's electricity consumption. Ils voient bien que euh, s'ils continuent à accueillir des data centers, en fait, euh, bah, il n'y aura pas assez de capacité de production, donc ça ne sera juste pas possible. Et ils ne peuvent pas enlever, en fait, euh, de la production électrique des habitants pour des data centers. Here he comes. Let's turn up the light. Will streaming lead to a massive blackout? The tech giants can always be counted on to disrupt all that. Their new endeavor is finding a way to make their own power. Facebook and Apple, ils se sont mis ensemble pour construire des fermes solaires. Euh, Apple a construit des petits barrages hydrauliques aussi. Donc il y a quand même aussi un, un quelque chose qui se passe de très d'ailleurs, enfin euh, qui peut être inquiétant pour les opérateurs énergétiques aux États-Unis, c'est que Google, Apple, etc. sont devenus des spécialistes de l'énergie et pourraient devenir même des opérateurs énergétiques s'ils le souhaitaient, parce qu'ils sont tellement euh, tellement forts sur toutes les régulations, sur la production, sur toutes ces dimensions là que euh, ils pourraient clairement euh, remplacer euh, certains opérateurs traditionnels qui sont un peu à la traîne et qui sont encore un peu trop charbon. Moderation should have been a solution. The tech giants opted for the opposite. Ever more data and devices. Le streaming implique un gros déploiement de l'infrastructure et un développement de l'infrastructure bâti en fait, que ce soit les centres de données, que ce soit les antennes, etc. Donc tout ça repose sur le fait qu'on continue à développer les réseaux, qu'on continue à développer la fibre, qu'on continue à développer les réseaux mobiles. Et, et par la suite, sûrement pour quelques entreprises américaines, le fait qu'on déploie des réseaux satellitaires basse orbite. And ever more gadgets. Things get streamed on smartphones, computers, tablets, TVs, all items with an atrocious carbon footprint. Dans un smartphone, par exemple, qui peut être le terminal avec lequel on écoute de la musique ou on regarde une vidéo, dans un smartphone, on a entre 40 et 60 matériaux différents. On a en gros une quarantaine de minerais. Et donc, ce qui coûte cher aujourd'hui d'un point de vue environnemental, c'est l'extraction des minerais. Let's open the black box and take a closer look. There are the basics, nickel, silver, gold, copper, aluminium, tin, and lead. Then there are the less common, funny-sounding minerals like antimony, lithium, cobalt, bromine, and indium. Lastly, there are the rare earth metals, which are very difficult to extract and dwindling at a rapid pace. They're called neodymium, lanthanum, terbium, and so on. 
Minute amounts of them all are found in our devices. Pour fabriquer une barrette mémoire d'un gramme, on a besoin de 16 000 fois son poids. Pour fabriquer une voiture, on a besoin de 54 fois son poids. Et donc, il n'y a rien qui soit aussi intensif en matière première, de, parmi tout ce qui est fabriqué par les êtres humains, que le cœur des composants électroniques qui sont ceux qu'on utilise, notamment dans le réseau, mais aussi dans d'autres appareils avec lesquels on va pouvoir bénéficier du streaming. Take TVs, these prehistoric artifacts that are trying to hold computers off from invading the living room. Aside from using a hundred times more power than a phone, its size makes its manufacture incredibly polluting. The damage has been done before it's even turned on. 80% of its environmental impact has already been made. There are three sources of pollution to a streamed video. The first at 25% originates in data centers. The second makes up 28% and stems from network infrastructure, cables and relays. The third and most significant involves the item being used to watch the video, both its production and energy consumption, and accounts for 47% of greenhouse gas emissions. Our eco-consciousness can rest easy. The scene of the crime is in Asia and Africa. So, in fact, everything that is very polluant is far away from us. So, what do we see? We see our smartphones or our computers with this beautiful vitre, all clean, so clean that we spend our days and our fingers on it. And that's it. And at the end, we get rid of it. And that's it. So, we don't have any experience de la réalité vraiment matérielle de ce document, de cet objet. We're constantly being pushed to upgrade even though we should be keeping things in working order for as long as possible. The slightest issue and we get rid of them. Their life expectancy rarely exceeds 18 months despite being in great working order. We're in a constant chase to keep getting better looks, more pixels, faster speeds, more use and connectivity. Carried away by this perceived obsolescence, we throw things away without looking back. These ancient appareils, aujourd'hui, on sait très mal les recycler. On recycle à peu près une vingtaine de pourcents. Et sur les métaux rares en eux-mêmes, c'est à peu près 1%. C'est très difficile de recycler des, des métaux rares. Si je vous donne un exemple, c'est comme une miche de pain. Vous avez euh, la farine, la levure, le sel, l'eau, et je vous la donne et je vous dis, ben, tu me resépares ces quatre éléments, s'il te plaît. Ça n'est pas possible. We recycle very little and very badly, only recovering small amounts and using means that have disastrous environmental and safety consequences. With each technological breakthrough, history repeats itself. When 3G appeared, all the phones on the market had to be replaced to adapt to the new norm. Same thing for 4G and all future iterations. Et je suis assez sidérée de voir qu'on n'en parle pas plus que ça, parce que c'est le quotidien. Aujourd'hui, on passe à la 5G. Très bien, ça va aider pour plein de secteurs. Par contre, personne ne parle de l'enjeu du recyclage. Ah oui, oui, le recyclage, c'est tout ce qu'on dit. Et finalement, euh, bah, des acteurs comme moi, on sait parfaitement où est-ce que ça atterrit. Unable to recycle, we keep digging deeper into the same mines. These natural resources aren't unlimited. Some studies suggest that within 30 to 50 years, there won't be enough minerals left to make technological equipment. On a un usage totalement immodéré du numérique, euh, sans limite. Et donc pour cette dernière nuit d'ivresse numérique, d'une certaine façon, eh bien nous sommes en train d'handicaper la capacité de nos enfants ou des générations à venir à utiliser elles aussi le numérique, puisque c'est une ressource critique, non renouvelable, donc en quantité finie. The house is on fire. Should streaming go down with it? Streaming deserves to be followed because it's not a simple technology. It revolutionized the way we communicate, create and work. Everyone can now potentially share content without an intermediary such as a TV or radio station, a label or a studio. Streaming has given the web its cultural spring. Le streaming est une avancée technologique passionnante pour l'accès à la musique. Euh, euh, moi, je vois des, 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 des jeunes adultes qui ont 20 ans et qui ont une connaissance de la musique. Euh, je trouve ça génial, vraiment. Qu'on puisse accéder à de la pop coréenne euh, et du rap nigérian euh, et du, du, de, de la folk mexicaine. Euh, 
euh, très facilement. From popular science tutorials to conferences and online courses, streaming is fulfilling all the Internet's promise as a way to access universal knowledge. Euh, moi, je sais que j'ai des mômes. Euh, ils, ils m'ont ils fait découvrir des choses sur YouTube que je ne soupçonnais pas. Des gens qui faisaient de la médiation scientifique en recherche sur YouTube, des YouTubeurs ultra talentueux qui diffusent les articles de recherche, euh, des mômes de 14 ans, 16 ans qui regardent ça, euh, et ces, ces gens-là, ils le font mieux que euh, nous-mêmes, les, les chercheurs. Euh, mais ils connaissent la recherche. Euh, Moi-même, j'ai appris des choses en regardant, je suis devenu consommateur de ça. Je dis, je, je, je m'attendais. Donc, ce n'est pas que les chats, YouTube. In the near future, streaming might even become an ally against climate change, as the IPCC has suggested, by setting up its own YouTube channel. A work tool for its scientists, the stream gives research a voice, a megaphone to raise awareness of the environmental crisis. Le streaming est une formidable technologie dans un ensemble de situations critiques. C'est aussi une formidable technologie quand on est en pleine pandémie pour continuer à fonctionner, pour continuer aussi à accéder à de la culture, etc. Le, 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 le sujet, c'est l'usage raisonnable, en fait, du streaming. C'est ça, le sujet. Streaming est nécessaire, donc il doit aller green. Comment peut it être tamed? Sit down. No part of our existence comes without a carbon footprint. Housing, clothes, food, transportation, all these sectors are looking to boost their environmental efficiency. Streaming, like the rest of the digital realm, is breaking from this new norm. We're burning data hand over fist. It's not just food we waste, but also technology. The time has come for streaming to fall into rank. Bah, la sobriété appliquée au streaming, c'est pas non plus le retour à l'âge de pierre, c'est pas non plus le goulag, c'est pas de l'écologie punitive, c'est simplement être raisonnable. Et donc, quand on regarde une émission où la qualité de l'image, par exemple, n'est pas absolument prépondérante, je peux peut-être le regarder en haute définition plutôt qu'en 4K. Euh, ça sera tout à fait suffisant pour suivre un journal télé télévisé. Streaming has made us adepts of immediacy. No need to wait to watch a program anymore. It's abolished schedules and must start on demand, meaning instantly. C'est tellement génial, c'est tellement pratique, c'est tellement chouette le streaming. Parce que c'est vrai que c'est vraiment pratique et que c'est vraiment chouette. Et cette instantanéité et le fait de pouvoir consommer des dizaines de milliers de films ou de documentaires comme ça en claquant des doigts. Il y a un côté magique, il y a un côté super pratique. Et donc on a envie de pouvoir continuer ces usages-là, quand bien même on commence quand même à prendre conscience que ça a des impacts absolument délétères sur l'environnement. Reflecting our online overindulgence, streaming has made us more impatient than ever. Going from 2G to 3G and then 4G has sped up connections, rolling out a new network each time, all with new relays, new servers, a new crop of phones. We're destroying the planet to earn a few milliseconds. On évolue toujours vers des réseaux de plus en plus puissants, euh, des 5G, 6G, 8G, on va y arriver, parce que la bande passante doit être toujours, toujours plus grande ou toujours, toujours plus efficace euh, pour plein d'enjeux. Parce qu'on est dans, dans, dans l'ère de l'instantanéité, on est dans la tyrannie du maintenant, tout de suite, et qu'on veut effacer toute l'expérience nécessaire de la frustration, de l'attente, de l'ennui, one that nothing can stop, unbridled streaming feeds to saturation, facilitating a content binge. Binge watching a show for eight hours without pause has become the norm. There is no end to streaming. On Twitch, a streamer has exceeded 500 days of streaming live. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ron, GP Hustler. I've been streaming 24-7 on Twitch now for about 2,100 hours. Data has invaded our lives, and this is just the beginning. The metaverse promises a parallel, immersive virtual universe in the near future. Everyone will perform as an avatar or hologram to play, work, talk, learn. In such an all-digital universe, streaming will be king, capping off its conquest of our very existence. From a simple tool to access cultural content, streaming has become a means of social interaction. First, the feeling of presence. This is the defining quality of the metaverse. You're going to really feel like you're there with other people. You'll see their facial expressions, you'll see their body language, maybe figure out if they're actually holding a winning hand. 
In the metaverse, streaming will be as vital as breathing and its carbon footprint incalculable. The lack of transparency on all the stakeholders' part is to blame. One thing's for certain, the gush of data is enormous. Aujourd'hui, on pourrait dire que au niveau du numérique, euh, on, on se situe comme avant le choc pétrolier des années 70, quand on a eu en gros une hausse très importante des prix et que tout le monde s'est rendu compte qu'il fallait changer de modèle. Euh, sur la data, euh, elle semble gratuite, euh, infinie. Euh, on ne se rend pas compte de l'impact que ça a. On est complètement captif de toutes ces données. Donc on est dans un système aussi de plus en plus complexe de gestion de tout par la donnée. Et euh, on n'a pas effectivement encore vécu de choc numérique qui permettrait peut-être de se dire euh, changeons, de, changeons de méthode. Streaming needs to move in a new direction. Adopt a more economical model where data is neither free nor unlimited and put an end to this image of digital as intangible. Ça fait 30 ans qu'on nous fait croire que, que ça n'a pas d'impact en fait. Et comme n'importe quelle industrie, ça a un impact. Et du coup, comme n'importe quelle industrie, il faut aussi le réguler, il faut aussi le maîtriser et il faut le faire entrer dans un cadre dans lequel c'est soutenable. À un moment où chaque degré compte, où les citoyens sont being appelés à réduire leur empreinte carbone, les acteurs digitales continuent de marcher en avant comme si le climat n'a pas existé. Exist. Blindé par sa propre growth, le streaming continue de grandir sans se demander de sa propre pollution. On a besoin de savoir en temps réel ce que ça coûte quand on, quand on a une action, quand on, quand on, on a un geste numérique, qu'est-ce qu'il coûte Ce genre de connaissance va être indispensable si on veut arriver à des neutralités carbone dont on parle, si on veut arriver à la protection de l'environnement et à respecter les recommandations du GIEC, il va falloir qu'on en passe par cette éducation et par cette capacité outillée euh, des citoyens à savoir exactement ce qu'ils sont en train de faire et l'incidence que ça a. As with banning straws or plastic bags, small gestures can do the planet a world of good. Were you thinking of using 4G at full speed? It's better to opt for Wi-Fi, which uses three times less energy. Rather than streaming movies and series on public transportation, download them ahead of time. In a video call, be aware that filters like blurred backgrounds or cat's ears use up a lot of data and aren't a requirement. If you can do away with a video, so much the better. But above all else, take care of your devices, don't bin them. If you want an upgrade, get something that can be repaired. And if you're a film buff, why not switch to a projector? Le vidéo projecteur sur la phase d'utilisation va consommer plus d'électricité, donc aura plus d'impact environnemental sur la phase d'utilisation. Mais sa fabrication est tellement moins impactante que celle d'un écran à diagonale identique euh, qu'il vaut mieux utiliser un vidéo projecteur. Donc, our phones, tablets and computers are the largest sources of digital greenhouse gases. Their glossy good looks don't show it, but they're awful, energy-hungry polluters that we keep near and dear and upgrade as soon as we can. Four absolument réduire euh, la consommation d'équipements, c'est sûr. Il faut que ça dure plus longtemps. On ne peut pas vivre dans un monde dans lequel des smartphones vont durer, euh, vont durer que 2 à 3 ans. Ce n'est pas normal. Et utiliser des ressources pour faire ça, c'est euh, quand, quand même pas réfléchir sur euh, ce, ce qu'on aura disponible dans les prochaines années. Comment peuvent-ils être plus longs quand les systèmes systems change tout le temps, making still functional devices obsolete? when compression algorithms require even more technologically advanced processors, when repairs on these highly sophisticated items cost about the same as a new device. It would require us to change our relationship with digital content, to decelerate, to give it its proper time and place, to give it a different purpose, less binging and more savoring. Comment faire durer un équipement Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire pour l'ensemble de mes usages Comment, en fait, j'entre je, je, dans une autre relation avec le numérique, avec l'écosystème numérique, dans le sens où euh, un téléphone qui est moins puissant, tu développes moins, moins d'usages, ou en cas, tu es moins sur ton téléphone. Parce qu'en fait, c'est plus, plus lent, etc. 
Et finalement, tu dis, bon, est-ce que j'ai besoin de tout faire par le numérique In 2025, streaming will turn 30. That the same year the IPCC predicts we'll exceed the one and a half degree temperature increase that means irreversible climate change. What if streaming could finally obey the IPCC? They're part of the same generation, and the age of 30 is the age of reason. If streaming won't regulate itself, it must be helped along and potentially set up a legal framework. There is no miracle cure. Clean streaming is first and foremost less streaming. At a time when the internet pollutes more than aviation, and soon more than cars, isn't it time for a digital detox? But asking today's internet users to be temperate is like asking a smoker to quit whilst leaving a carton of cigarettes in their living room. Moi, je ne crois pas vraiment à, à cette idée de dire aux gens « faites attention, soyez responsable à votre, à, votre, à votre consommation ». Il faut plutôt poser la question aux entreprises et se poser la question à nous en tant que, en tant que société. Qu'est-ce qu'on demande aux entreprises Et il faut qu on, qu on, que les politiques se saisissent, je pense, du sujet pour euh, voir bah, voilà, qu'est-ce qu'on autorise, qu'est-ce qui est, qu est, qu est, euh, qu est pertinent, euh, qu'est-ce qui fonctionne bien technologiquement en termes... Qu'est-ce qui est économe Il y a plein de progrès possibles. Aujourd'hui, on ne les fait pas parce que la puissance informatique est tellement disponible et c'est pas cher qu'en fait, on n'a pas de raison de le faire, on va dire, au niveau du, du marché. Mais il y a plein d'options qui sont là, qui sont possibles, qui sont sous la main. Et le jour où ça deviendra soit rentable, soit vital, eh ben elles seront là et elles seront euh, prises en main, je pense. Technology is a mere tool at our service. It's up to us to put it in its place and align it to our needs. Not what's being sold to us, but what allows us to maintain a balance of our resources and that delicious pleasure of the click. Will you play with me?